In our classes together, we have been following through, um, in the first class, the root of the apostasy, its beginnings, and the warnings against it that we saw throughout the New Testament and specifically into the book of Revelation and the letters to the Ecclesias. In our second class, we looked at the ascension of this apostate ecclesia, or church as it became known, to the heavens, the political heavens, where it has remained enthroned to this day. In our third class, we looked at its resume of persecution against the saints and the martyrs of Jesus, as they are called in the book of Revelation. In the fourth class, we looked at the seducing doctrines that hold the lives of so many captive in, in a web almost, like a spider awaiting death. And our goal has been to recognize this system using the symbols and the identification given to us in the apocalypse to recognize its teaching, its history, its actions. It has not been our goal to poke fun of it, although perhaps some of our comments yesterday may have been taken in this way. We believe, brothers and sisters, this is very serious stuff. It's a matter of life and death. We need to clearly be able to recognize who this system is without any shadow of doubt, to identify its teachings so that we are not seduced by it, to not have any fellowship with it in any way, to not have the mark of the beast in our forehead by its doctrines and its teachings, to not be partakers of her sins, and consequently that we would receive not of her plagues, which it points out to us are death. And so we want to spend our time today looking at the sort of end of the story, I guess, or coming to the end of the story, and that is the current events that are going on right now. We want to spend some time looking at how the nations are being gathered together specifically through the teaching of the false prophet. And to do this, we'd like to kind of back up and give a little bit of context to the passage in Revelation chapter 16 that we had read together. It's the context, of course, of the Battle of Armageddon. And we are living right in this very time period. He gathered them together to a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. And we recognize, brothers and sisters, that the climax that is coming is moving very, very quickly. The word Armageddon is a transliteration, as we would call it. It is simply a Hebrew phrase that has been transliterated into the Greek, meaning that they've used Greek sounds to basically, or Greek letters, to signify the sounds of the Hebrew phrase. It's a phrase that our brother Thomas has interpreted for us as armor, gay, and don, a heap of sheaves in a valley for judgment. And brothers and sisters, once upon a time, somebody told me, well, there is absolutely no proof for the fact that armor, or arima, is a heap of sheaves. And I thought, well, brother Thomas couldn't have just sort of made this stuff up. I'd read it, and I hadn't really sort of thought a whole lot further, and he doesn't cite the verse. But if you just come back to Ruth chapter 3, I think it's important for us to recognize that he wasn't just playing around when he, he said these things, but he had reasons for what he said. And as you read through Alpha's Israel and Eureka, quite often every single verse is not put in there. Quite often, if you've got some of the older editions, some of the newer ones have the verses ascribed to it. But some of the older ones, he speaks in biblical languages, just picking out phrases to put his sentences together. And it doesn't really tell us always where the phrase comes from. Well, in Ruth chapter 3, it's an interesting little uh, section because we find that it is the night time. It is the time, basically, when Ruth is coming to see Boaz. And in verse Six, she went down to the floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he lay down at the end of a heap of corn. And she came softly and uncovered his feet and laid down. So where is Boaz then at this point in time? Well, he is after the harvest. If you come down to verse 23, it's the barley harvest and the wheat harvest, and basically we find there that he is in the threshing floor, verse 2. So this is a heap of corn, or a heap of sheaves of corn, in the threshing floor. It's not in the field, it's not in the marketplace, it's in the threshing floor. And that word there, heap of, heap of corn, is the word arima, which is where Brother Thomas got armor of Armageddon from. 
And so we can be sure, brothers and sisters, that these things are indeed true. But we need to do our homework to search the scriptures daily whether those things are so. And so we have there the picture of a heap of sheaves in a valley for threshing. Of course, the word guy is an easy one for us. Gehenna, the valley of the son of Hinnom. We know that one. We use it talking to our interested friends. And the word Dan is simply transliterated into Don, meaning judgment. So it's a heap of sheaves in a valley for judgment. And it's a Hebrew phrase, which immediately has to tell us that we have to go back to the Old Testament to find out where this phrase comes up elsewhere. Where is it that this idea or this concept is told to us? And of course, we go back to Joel chapter 3. And we find there that it's the context of this chapter and this verse, Joel chapter 3, Behold, in those days and at that time when I bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, which is the exact contextual time period of the drying up of the river Euphrates we're looking at in Revelation chapter 16. Well, what's he going to do? He's going to gather all the nations. And we could almost color that in in Joel and go through and color that in in Revelation. In fact, we could color it in in Ezekiel and Zechariah as well because it's a consistent theme, the gathering of the nations for judgment. He gathers them to a place called Jehoshaphat, which is the valley of the judgments of Yah. And there we find that he says he will plead with them there, which means to judge them, for his people and his heritage Israel, my people, he says. And let's not miss that. They're in the land. They are at this point in time not completely on the Lord's side in that sense. The Elijah mission and those things hasn't quite brought them to the recognition of Christ, but he calls them my people. We want to keep that in our minds and our hearts. He says, for my people and my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered amongst the nations and parted my land. And he goes on to say in verses 12 to 15, let the nations be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, the valley of those judgments of Yah, multitudes and multitudes in the valley of decision. Or if you look in your margin, it's concision. And if you look it up, it's actually the word threshing. So you've got a multitude of nations in a valley for threshing, for the day of Yahweh is near in the valley of threshing. And so we have there the context of, Eze of Revelation chapter 16 and the sixth vial. It is the time in which Israel will be back in the land. So when we go back to Revelation chapter 16 and we compare these things together, and I would just have it open there because we're going to make several references to it. Keep a finger or a marker in there. We will put them on the screen, but it's always helpful to see it in our own Bible, so these things imprint upon our minds. Revelation chapter 16, and at verse 12, we read, The sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. The kings of the sun's rising, as it was correctly read for us. This is the son of righteousness we read of in Malachi, who shall arise with healing in his wings. And that is the drying up of this Euphratean power that will bring this about. Now it's interesting that the idea of the Euphrates appears earlier on in the book of Revelation. As has been mentioned, we go back to Revelation chapter 9, it's the time period of the sixth trumpet. The sixth angel sounded and I heard a voice. And he goes on to say, Loose the four angels that are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed. And he continues that they were to slay the third part of men. So that was the job of these four angels. They are these four powers that are bound up in the area of the Euphrates. Now, Brother Thomas, following through the continuous historical unveiling of the book of Revelation, based on this, turned around and interpreted those things, that these four angels were the four Muslim powers that would come across from the area of the river Euphrates and into both the Middle East and across further into the area of Byzantium, the area of Turkey as well. The first of which was the Seljuk Turks around the 1100s. They were followed by Genghis Khan. After him was another individual named Timurlane, 
who basically was a very destructive man in the power that he had when he went forward. A very large empire, almost on par with Alexander the Great in its size. And of course, the last of these was the Ottoman Empire, where finally, in 1453, they would destroy the Byzantine Empire and capture, or darken, I guess you could say to a degree, the third part and kill with fire the third part of men. And so it was that understanding those things, Brother Thomas went back to the 16th chapter and said, if we correctly understand that the four angels of the river Euphrates overflowing are the four Muslim powers that would basically have influence over the area that in question in the apocalypse, then the idea in chapter 16 of them being dried up would speak to the retreat of these powers back into their area or certainly removal altogether. And so he wrote in Eureka, the waters of the great river Euphrates represent the military power of the Ottoman Empire. And he went on to say that this military and political power of the Ottoman Empire was to be dried up by the wrath of the sixth vial, by the way, or that the way for a certain class of kings might be cleared from all hindrances and impediments to their enterprise in its beginning. And so it was that he understood it would be necessary for the establishment of Israel in the land, according to the description given in Ezekiel chapter 38, in the latter days, when these people were gathered out of all nations by the sword and so on and so forth, Joel chapter 3, Zechariah 14, and those other prophecies, he recognized that it would be necessary for this power of the Ottoman Turks described here to be dried up. He writes, Now any person acquainted with the present insecure condition of Palestine under the Ottoman dominion must be satisfied from the testimony that some other power friendly to Israel must then have become paramount over the land, which is able to guarantee protection to them and to put the surrounding tribes in fear. He goes on, the finger of God has indicated a course to be pursued by Britain which cannot be evaded. The decree has long since gone forth which calls upon the Lion of Tarshish to protect the Jews. To Britain then, the prophet calls us, or calls as a protector of the Jewish nation to plant Israel as an ensign upon the mountains. When this is accomplished to the required extent, it becomes a notable sign of the times. It will then be seen that the political Euphrates is evaporating to dryness and that Israel is walking in the way of the kings of the east. Now, there is a pretty incredible, in my mind, prediction made on faith in the word of God, made on an understanding of the continual historical unraveling or un unveiling or unrolling, really, of the book of Revelation, following the pattern that Daniel had given in those beasts and the succession. And so it was, brethren and sisters, that our brethren and sisters were thrilled to see these events take place. When a man like Lawrence of Arabia, with those British and Australian powers who landed in Egypt and then transported across to the area of the Arabian Peninsula and would sweep up into Palestine, eventually overthrowing the Turks, Alan be entering into Jerusalem, walking into Jerusalem, and establishing there a British protectorate over the land. If you've ever doubted the validity of the continuous historical point of view, interpretation of the book of Revelation, surely, brethren and sisters, this evidence should dry up any of those doubts. Seventy years before these events took place, Brother Thomas correctly predicted the role of Britain, the fate of the Ottoman Turks, and how the Jews would go back into the land. This was based on his interpretation of the vials, which was based on his understanding of the trumpets, which was patterned after his understanding of the whole of the apocalypse and the prophetic word of God. Now these faithful predictions in our day have become established historical facts. Why now 
would we then look for another interpretation for the book? Why? For what possible reason? It came true. And now we're going to change what these things mean? Brothers and sisters, even people out in the world can see that. This is a Jew, a man named Michael Pragai, author of a book called Faith and Fulfillment, went to the Knesset, picked up a copy of Alpha Israel, and read it cover to cover, twice, and then had this to say, Thomas correctly predicted the decisive role Great Britain was to play some 70 years later, when after World War I, the League of Nations conferred on her the Mandate of Palestine, a focal provision of which was the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people. Had Thomas lived to see that day, no doubt he would have rejoiced, and for good reason, he goes on. And so, brothers and sisters, when we think about those things, let's not fall into the trap of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Back in 1914, there was all kinds of predictions. The Lord Jesus Christ would return to a certain mountain, and they were to be gathered together, and all to be taken up, and of course, it never happened. Well, we do a quick adjustment of the dates and we try it all over again and it never happened the second time. Well, it happened spiritually. And of course, they lost a huge amount of membership because of this. And so they went through all their writings to expunge any prophetical things that could basically uh, convict them again of something equally as damaging to the numbers of their church. So it was a while ago, we had a conversation with a friend of ours from school. His name was Zachariah. We were out putting up lecture um, posters for lectures in shop windows, and we met Zachariah on the street corner. And there was this Jew handing out watchtowers. Hmm. You know, now there's an anomaly. So we thought, well, what on earth is this all about? So we talked to Zachariah, and we said, let's, let's sit down. And we spent some about 13 weeks going through, and we said, all we really want to talk about, forget the devil and, and all your favorite hobby horses. You're a Jew. So you explain to me how as a Jew you can be a Jehovah's Witness. And we went through and we looked at all the prophecies about Israel going back to the land. And eventually he said, you know, he said, I can understand how you Christadelphians would believe that based on the word of God and all those prophecies we looked at. But it's not in the watchtower. So therefore I cannot believe it. Isn't it, said we, and pulled out of our bag. Pastor Russell's book that Brother Paul had lent to us. And you look through and you think you pulled out the Holy Grail. Ooh, you know, this book's written from the 18, whatever it was. And we handed it to him. And I said, read out for me that paragraph where he basically rabbits Brother Thomas in Alphys Israel saying about the Jews going back to the land. And they just stand there with an absolute look of incredib- incredulousness on their face. I used that word wrong. But anyway, just completely and absolutely blown away that here is the watchtower, Pastor Russell, the founder of the whole group. And there is the prophecy saying that Israel will go back to the land, the Jews, and it's now taken out of all their books. Well, at that point in time, his mother came running out of the kitchen and chased us out of the house with a frying pan saying we had Satan. So that was the end of that conversation. I never saw him again. But the point is, brothers and sisters, We got it right. Not we in a prideful way, but we in the sense that this is the word of God. And he tells us the end before it happens. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. And these things have been given to us and to our children. The glory of God is to conceal a thing, and the honor of kings is to search out a matter, and the matter was searched out. And it was written down, and it came true. Why on earth now would we look elsewhere? It's interesting that that drying up of the river Euphrates has continued to go on. The Ottoman power, but then in 1948, when the Arabs came against the Jews, those rivers overflowing once again to try and get rid of Israel in the land, completely and absolutely annihilated 350,000 Jews against 45 million Arabs, but the word of God stands. And they could have had 6 billion people against 350,000 Jews. It wouldn't have made any difference. God had said, this is what would happen, and so it did. 1956, Egypt again defeated. 67, 
when they tried to come against Israel again and were ready for an invasion, six days and the armies of all those nations defeated. 73, once again, the Arabs defeated. 1982, Jordan abandons the West Bank and leaves it to Israel. The Palestinian failures in establishing their homeland. We think of the, the latest of Ehud Barak, the most foolish Jew of the time, who would turn around and give to Yasser Arafat the West Bank and half of Jerusalem. There's only one more man stupider than he was, and that was Yasser Arafat. Because he turned around and said no. And so consequently we see the way things are today. Brothers and sisters, the hand of God is even stopping Israel from giving away what it has to have. It's against the mountains of Israel, which of course is the West Bank. Iraq. The Gulf War. What do you think that was all about? Here was a nation straddling the Euphrates, overflowing down into Kuwait, threatening Israel. What happened to it? Dried up completely. You see, brothers and sisters, the issue for the Arabs is the river Euphrates. It is Britain going in and drying them up. In fact, Osama bin Laden had this to say. Our nation, the Islamic world, has been tasting humiliation and degrada er, de er, yeah, degradation for more than 80 years. What happened 80 years ago? Well, 80 years ago is when the river Euphrates was dried up, when Allenby went in, when Lawrence of Arabia came across and they pushed those Arab powers out. That's the issue as far as he is concerned. Of course, we've seen how futile his efforts have been. All they've done is serve to bring the United States and Britain, the kings of the south, the, the merchants of Tarshish and the young lions thereof, into the southern part of, of the land in accordance with the prophecies of Ezekiel 38 and Daniel 11. Thank you very much, Osama. In fact, it's interesting that the day, three days, I believe it was, before the 9-11 events took place, there was a letter from a Jew in the Jerusalem Post. And he said, you know, he said, we've tried war, 67 and 73. We've tried peace. Menachem Begin, Sadat, Rabin, and all these types of things. We've tried just about everything. He says, perhaps it's time that we as a Jewish people call upon the God of Abraham because we can't solve this problem and ask him to help us. And of course, that's when Bush had said, as far as foreign policy goes, we're pulling back, isolationists. <laughs> that's what he thought. And then those two little planes fly into the World Trade Center. And all of a sudden, Israel has the biggest military power in the world fighting its battles for it, getting rid of Osama bin Laden, Yasser Arafat, tied up as he is, Hussein, basically, uh, Saddam Hussein, who was paying for the, the, uh, the um, suicide bombers, their families, 20,000 US dollars each, all taken out of the way, because God has a purpose with this people. And so it is that in drying up this river, the way was prepared for the nation of Israel to exist. I would just like you to turn up for a moment, Psalm 102. Psalms are wonderful things. They are full of all kinds of little jewels. They're actually also full of all kinds of little prophecies. And this is one of them in Psalm 102. And at verse 13. Thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion, for the time to favor her, yea, the set time is come. For thy servants take pleasure in her stones and say, favor the dust thereof. And so it is that that's the time period in which we live, when God again has favored Zion. These men really were just tools in his hands to bring about his purpose. And so he set his heart to favor Zion. But, brothers and sisters, in this, there is a very great excitation to us, echoing that of Revelation 16 that we're going to look at. It says, when Yahweh shall build up Zion, verse 16, he shall appear in his glory. Well, that's got to tell us something, brethren and sisters, doesn't it? When God builds again Zion, that is when he will appear in his glory. 
So we live in the time of the apocalypse of the Son of God. The revealing of him to the earth because he's told us plainly. He's been building Zion since the 1898s. Back at the turn of the last century. Not the one that just went by, the one before. That's how long this has been going on. Over a hundred plus years. And so, brothers and sisters, we know that we're not in darkness. That that day should overtake us as a thief. He tells us right here. When I do this, know that I'm coming and sending my son. Now, the children of light, the children of the day, we are not of the night nor of the darkness. Let us therefore not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Now, let's go back to Revelation chapter 16, because sandwiched in between these verses we are looking at, of the gathering together of the nations and the physical battle, there is a verse in there that's important for us. The question was asked the other day, well, what period in time do we really live in? in the book of Revelation. And it's really Revelation chapter 16 and verse 15. That is the Christadelphian verse, the time period in which we live. Because you see, before the verse, we have, these are the, well, verse 12, the drying up of the Euphrates. We've been seeing that going on. That's historical for us now. We have then also the frog spirits that we're going to look at now. But it says that these frog spirits are going out for the purpose, at the end of the verse 14, to gather the nations, to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And then the battle of Armageddon is verse 16. He gathers them to a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And in between those two verses, the Lord Jesus Christ says exactly the same thing. Behold, I come. That's to us, brethren and sisters. We live between those two verses. That's us. That's our time period. I come as a thief. It doesn't have to be to us. We're not in darkness. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And so we have the blessing to him that readeth. And those who hear the words of the prophecy and keep those things, for the time is at hand, and indeed it is, brethren and sisters. Because we live in the time of the preparing. Going back now to verse 13. I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Well, these spirits are teachings. He goes on to say, that they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And these teachings, brethren and sisters, notice the words there, they are spirits or teachings of devils. We can think back to the first letter of John in chapter 4. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. So a spirit is a teaching. But these are teachings of devils. It is interesting in James chapter 3 in verses 14 to 16 where he says, this wisdom, and he's talking about the wickedness of the previous verse, those who basically are bitter and envying and strife in their hearts and they glory not and lie not against the truth we're told to. So this wisdom, this contentious wisdom, descends not from above, but is earthy, sensual, devilish. But where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. And the words there, brethren and sisters, for devilish is demoniacal. And confusion, of course, reminds us of Babylon the Great, revolution and anarchy. And so it is that we look for those frog spirits and we identify the symbol of the frog with that of the French-speaking people who for many years, outside of apocalyptic language, have been identified with this. It's been a known fact. You can see the frogs on the banners. It's interesting that when the, I wish I'd have brought this one with me, but when the Euro Tunnel was built, and all these things were going on, there was a prominent newspaper in Britain that had a big title regarding the idea of the French getting a little bit close to the British, and it said, Frog Off. That's the way it's been. That's not apocalyptic, really, is it? That's the facts. It's a historical fact. The Shield of Clovis. There they are, the Frog's Force. They're still there in the Rhymes tapestries. You can go there and see them today, as the person who went and took this photo did. 
So we live in the time period of that seventh vial, when basically, or the sixth vial, when these things, these frog spirits will go out. And they are, of course, related to that French Revolution from the previous vials that have been taking place. This revolutionary spirit that spread its doctrines first through France, and then, of course, Spain and Italy and Germany, and even as far as the Vatican. These ideas, the revolts that happened in Belgium and Germany and Hungary and Serbia, the unification of Italy, Mussolini uh, for, coming on later on, but Garibaldi and his, his uh, followers at first. All these different groups, basically, that came together out of anarchy, and they have sort of been a turning over of all those things that had stood in Europe for thousands of years. And they go forward in their teachings, shaping society, socialism, humanism, atheism, philosophy, the wisdom of this world that is foolishness with God. And brethren and sisters, let us not grab a hold of that wisdom. We've been looking at the frog spirit. Let's just very quickly turn back to Exodus chapter 8. Because, of course, there were frogs in Egypt, weren't they? What were they all about? They were about, in Exodus 8, the freedom and the emancipation of the Jews. But it's interesting that we see in Exodus chapter 8 and verse 3, verse 2, he says, I will smite all thy borders with frogs. And he goes on to tell us that the River shall bring forth frogs abundantly. The river. Hmm. We're dealing with the river Euphrates right now, aren't we? And we read on there that it's basically that these things shall go up and come into thine house, into thy bedchamber, upon thy bed, into the house of thy servants, and upon thy people, and upon thine ovens, and into thy kneading trough. And the frogs shall come up both on thee and upon thy people and upon thy servants. And of course, we read in the Psalms that the frogs did corrupt. And that's what they are there to do. But notice where they come. Into your house, children's rights. Into your bedchambers, the equality of the sexes. Into your bed, alternate lifestyles. Into the house of your servants, unions in the workplace, and all these types of ideas, socialism, to the people, the brotherhood of mankind, to love man more than God, and into the kneading troughs, which was, of course, where they got their food from, wasn't it? Our schools, where our children are taught, where their minds are fed, that the frog spirits are in all of those things. Let's be aware, brothers and sisters, that the spirit of the age is a spirit of demons that are sent out to gather the nations to the Battle of Armageddon. Let's not be fooled by these things. Let's not be deceived by them. Let's not be drawn in by the frog spirits in our homes and in our ecclesias. Well, they certainly have been busy, and they certainly have been at work. Newspapers and headlines full of the revolutions that have been taking place all across Europe, in fact, right down to China. And so it is, the eventual result of these gatherings will be the nations coming, as Ezekiel described, as a cloud to cover the land. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm, and thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land. Thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. Just turn to Ezekiel chapter 38 for a moment, and notice the character. Because this is the work of the frog spirits. It is to gather the nations to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And so when we look in Ezekiel chapter 38, we say, well, what kind of spirit do the nations have there that come down? What is their contention? What is their issue? And as we read through Ezekiel chapter 38, we have in verse 8, they are coming against the mountains of Israel, the West Bank. That's their area of contention. To turn thine hand upon the people, verse 12. An anti-Israel, anti-Zionist, anti-Semitic attack. Call it what you want. They're all the same thing. Anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, anti-Israel. It's against my people, the Jews. Against my heritage. He says in Joel chapter 3 verse 2, sorry, we missed verse 16 of Ezekiel 38, against my people Israel, 
and of course against Jerusalem in Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 2. That's the character of the attack. That's the mindset of those people that are coming. And so we see that mindset growing throughout the world. We see hostility to Israel, termed a racist state. Jews attacked in French, uh, anti-war protests. We've had them all throughout Canada in this last year. Throughout um, Ontario especially, synagogues and schools spray-painted. Montreal, uh, a Jewish school there, burned. These things are rearing their ugly heads, so much so that the Jews are beginning to leave and saying, we don't belong to Canada. We are Jewish. That is our home. We cannot claim citizenship here. We no longer see ourselves as part of this nation that is turning against us. The world is in hostility to God's people. Anti-Semitism, as time says, is on the march again. Let's be very careful, brethren and sisters, as we read, hear, or watch the news through whatever media we use, that we do not take up the same sentiment. Israel are the people of God, my people, he calls them. We do not want to be sucked into the vortex of the anti-Semitic, anti-Israel, anti-Zionist call of the world around us. Well, that's the background to the little phrase we'd like to really focus in on for the last few minutes now. I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth, and one of them is the false prophet. So what we'd like to do is take a few minutes and say, since we've been looking at the development of the apostasy, how is it that the false prophet is involved in gathering the nations to the Battle of Armageddon? By what method is she using? You see, if we think about the, the apostles, they went forward in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 to 8, and they were looking for the restoration of Israel. When they were therefore come together, they asked the Lord, saying, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? It was near to them. They looked for it. They went about speaking the hope of Israel. Paul says, For the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. That was their hope. His heart's desire, he says, for Israel, was that all Israel might be saved. But you see, the Roman Catholic Church has a very deep-rooted hatred of this people. It goes all the way back to these two characters that we were talking about earlier on. This is the statement, or one of the things that came out of the Nicene Council in 325. They're talking about Easter. It is unbecoming beyond measure that on this holiest of festivals we should follow the customs of the Jews. Henceforth, let us have nothing in common with this odious people, we ought not, therefore, to have anything in common with the Jews. Our worship follows a more convenient course. We desire, dearest brethren, to separate ourselves from the detestable company of the Jews. How, then, could we follow these Jews who are almost uh, certainly blinded? And this was the debate over the dating of the Easter festival. Let's have nothing to do with Passover and all this stuff. Let's move our dates away from that. So a great big controversy was solved based on, well, whatever they're doing, let's not do that. Not about whether it was right or wrong. Gregory of Nicaea, 385, describes them as slayers of the Lord, murderers of the prophets, adversaries of God, haters of God, men who show contempt for the law, foes of grace, enemies of the Father's faith, advocates of the devil, brood of vipers, slanderers, scoffers, men whose minds are in darkness, leaven of the Pharisees, assembly of demons, sinners, wicked men, stoners, and haters of the righteous. That's their view of the early church fathers, of the Jewish people, who Paul says that he would die if he could bring about their salvation. John Chrysostom Jews are the most worthless men. They are lecherous, greedy, rapacious. They are perfidious murderers of Christians. They worship the devil. Their religion is a sickness. The Jews are the odious assassins of Christ. And for killing God, believing in the Trinity, so this is deicide, which when you think about that for a moment, killing God absolutely makes no sense. 
But that is the doctrine. There is no expiation, no indulgence, no pardon. It's undoable what they've done. Christians may never cease vengeance. Jews must live in servitude forever. It is incumbent on all Christians to hate the Jews. They must have forgotten that all the apostles and the Lord Jesus and Christ himself were Jews. They forgot that almost the entire first century ecclesia at first were Jews. They went to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But of course, their doctrine, as we will look at, saw themselves as replacing the Jews in God's purpose. The idea that they must live in servitude forever became part of the doctrine of the church, embraced by Pope Innocent III. He says the Jews, by their own guilt, are consigned to perpetual servitude because they crucified the Lord. As slaves rejected by God, in whose death they wickedly conspire, they shall, be, uh, they shall by the effect of this very action recognize themselves as slaves of those whom Christ's death set free. And so it is that this idea of them killing Christ comes up over and over again in the Middle Ages, accused of desecrating the host, the Eucharist, where the body of Christ was to come. So they were accused of these things, that they were crucifying afresh the Son of God to themselves. All these different ideas, separated, made to live in servitude, forced to wear the yellow papal circles, the precursor to the Nazi star by many, many years, separated into ghettos, punished through those things like the Inquisition, burned at the stake with our brethren. The reason, brethren and sisters, for all of these things is the doctrine of the church. And it always seems to come back to that, doesn't it? Doctrine, teachings, the word of God that is able to make us wise unto salvation, rightly dividing the word of truth. And brothers and sisters, we need to hold on to that so we don't get swept into this vortex. Brother Roberts, in his book Christendom Astray, spent at least four lectures pointing out the error of Christendom regarding the doctrine of the kingdom of God. He says, on no subject will Christendom be found to have gone more astray than the subject of the kingdom of God, a subject which without exaggeration may be said to constitute the very backbone of the divine purpose with the earth and its inhabitants. And he goes on to say, and basically inform us, that the established biblical fact is that the true Christian hope is the hope of Israel. It's Israelitish. We've been adopted into it. We haven't taken it and changed it into something else. This opening of the way for the admission of the Gentiles did not destroy the Israelitish character of the hope. The effect was just the other way. Instead of Gentiles converting to the hope of Gentilism, by their reception of it, the hope converted them into Jews, conforming them into its essential Israelitish character. And brethren and sisters, I would put it to you that that's a doctrine that we're losing today. And I would suggest that we would all be very well advised to pick up Christendom astray and read it so that we don't become Christadelphians astray. Because when we lose this doctrine, as he points out, it's at the very core of the purpose of God. Because there is a very strong power out there pushing things in a different direction. And this is part of the fog spirit that's going out. Remember the words of Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 24. Thou hast confirmed to thyself thy people Israel to be a people unto thee forever, and thou, Yahweh, art become their God. It's without repentance. These things are unchangeable. This is the way it is, and we are simply adopted into their hope. However, the Catholic Church does not see things this way. Rather, it sees itself as heir of the world, the Israel of God, the true people of God. Israel has been written out of God's purpose. It's what we call replacement theology. And so we read in the Catholic Catechism that the Lord Jesus inaugurated his church, meaning the Catholics, by preaching the good news, that is, the coming of the reign of God, Promised over the ages in the scriptures to fulfill the Father's will, Christ ushered in the kingdom of heaven on earth. 
the church is the reign of Christ already present in mystery. And this teaching is what will grip many of the Christians. It goes on to say, henceforward, the church, endowed with the gifts of her founder and faithfully observing his precepts of charity, humility, and self-denial, receives the mission of proclaiming the establishment among all peoples, the kingdom of Christ and of God. And she is on earth the seed and the beginning of that kingdom. We have some writers, brethren and sisters, who would suggest to you that the ecclesia is the kingdom of God. This is papal doctrine. The kingdom of God awaits the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. We teach it plainly in our first principles. What is required? Well, it requires a king and a throne and a law and a land and a people. Those five elements. And we give lectures and have done for many years. The ecclesia is not the kingdom of God. Hopefully to be kings and priests when it comes. But that is the teaching of the Catholic Church. In fact, so much so do they believe this, and this idea that the Jews are out of God's purpose and in perpetual servitude. When Herzl went to the Pope in January the 10th in 1904, the Pius X, he asked him if he would support the Jewish state, and Pius turned around and said, well, I can't prevent the Jews from going to Jerusalem. He'd lost his temporal power. But we could never sanction it. The ground of Jerusalem, if it were not always sacred, has been sanctified by the life of Jesus Christ. As the head of the church, I cannot answer you otherwise. The Jews have not recognized our Lord, and therefore we cannot recognize the Jewish people. What he means is that the Jews will not become Catholics. And so therefore, they refuse to allow them any latitude whatsoever. The policy of Adolf Hitler, as von Papen said, of exterminating the Jews was simply putting into practice the high principles of the Catholic Church. They already tried to get rid of them. They weren't certainly going to support the idea of a Jewish state. And after the Inquisitions and whatever else, when Nazism came to power, they tried again to get rid of them. But as God says, though I make a full end of all nations whither I have scattered thee, I will not make a full end of thee. The doctrine of the teaching prime importance. This is the issue, brethren and sisters, that will bring the Catholic Church against the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a writer named Avro Manhattan, and this is what he writes about the Catholic Church and her relationship to Israel. The specter of the creation of such a theocracy has haunted the inner chambers of the Catholic Church from her earliest inception, and is still a dominant fear. Hence her equivocal role in world affairs surrounding the birth and existence of the state of Israel. Such a state was defined as a territorial entity erected upon racial and religious tenets. So the Catholic Church has a problem with this idea. It sees it as competition. And that's exactly what it is. It's called the seed of the woman versus the seed of the serpent. He goes on to say the Vatican could not and would not tolerate the establishment of an Israel which claimed messianic privileges, or rather messianic uniqueness, and would therefore compete with the Roman Catholic Church as the center of a future spiritual kingdom. That's exactly the issue that is going to come and bring this world to its attention. Rome or Jerusalem? It cannot and does not tolerate these things. In Vatican eyes, the millenarial yearning for the global he Hebrew theocracy represents a deadly threat to the eschatological teachings of the Catholic Church. When translated into concrete political terms, such a view spells not only rivalry, but notice his words here, implacable enmity. And so we have the idea of the millennium, of the kingdom of God on earth, of the Jews being at the center of this, it being a Hebrew theocracy as being something that the Catholic Church sees as the greatest enemy it has. And the enmity of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 has been playing out for 2,000 years. They have been doing their best to bruise the heel of the woman's 
but of course we know what will happen. Our brother Graham Pierce in the 1970s recognized this. He wrote in his book, The Vatican, or Russia, the Vatican, Invasion in Israel, by the time this invasion takes place, a great issue will have developed in the world. Babylon the Great versus Zion. The great issue of the apocalypse through the centuries coming to a head. They join the issue in the land of Israel, contending for rulership of the world. So the European Confederacy comes as a Christian crusade against the Jewish developments in the land of Israel. Let us not, brothers and sisters, realize, or let us not forget, I should say, that our doctrine, the hope of Israel, the kingdom of God on earth, is what is going to bring the Lord Jesus Christ and the Vatican into the battle that will take place. It is what is going to eventually remove the Vatican from this planet. Let's not lose that, doc that, that doctrine ourselves at this point in time. Let's not water it down. Let's not spiritualize it. Let's not forget those things. He goes on to say, and this is 1982, mind you, the Vatican fundamentally opposes the powerful Jewish theocracy, therefore, would become not only hostile to Zionism and consequently Israel, it would seek powerful allies to neutralize both. And that we have seen in the media and in the events going on in the world around. Remember we pointed out yesterday that there is one world leader that has visited the Pope more than any others in the history of mankind. His name is Yasser Arafat the leader of the Palestinian peoples. Remember the words? It would seek allies to neutralize Israel and Zionism. The Vatican, when the Pope went to Israel, there was an agreement between the Holy See and the PLO, a terrorist organization, that there needs to be a just and comprehensive peace in the Middle East for prosperity in the entire region. It goes on to say that it calls for a peaceful solution of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, which would realize the inalienable national legitimate rights and aspirations of the Palestinian people. That's a frog spirit, brothers and sisters. Liberty, equality, and fraternity against what God has set, that his people will go back into the land, that these people have equal rights to that land. It's God's land to give to whomsoever he will. But they think that mankind should decide these things. He also goes on to say that unilateral decisions and actions taken on Israel's behalf, altering the specific character and status of Jerusalem, are morally and legally unacceptable. They are affirming their moral and legal authority over the nation of Israel, and that is part of what will bring the nations down in the Battle of Armageddon. When John Paul did visit Jerusalem in March of 2000, it saw the papal flag flying over the city. Whoever would have believed such a thing? The result of the Vatican's support of the Palestinians sparked the current intifada that has been going on. Once they threw their support behind it, these things began. But there are other ways in which they are affecting this. There is the media that's being used very effectively. The film that's recently come out, The Passion of Jesus Christ, directed by Mel Gibson, a great hero of Hollywood. Mel Gibson, member of Opus Dei, whose father is a Holocaust supporter a denier, sorry, I should say, a Holocaust denier. This man who is at the core of the Roman Catholic Church in his heart and his mind. One of the newspapers tells us that few Christians today know the history of anti-Semitism and the way the passion stories were central to rekindling hatred of Jews from generation to generation. Many are embracing Gibson's movie and not understanding why Jews seem to be so threatened. Because this is what they did just prior to the Second World War. Inflaming the hatred of the Christians against the Jews. So that when it came time to pack them into train cars, they would go along willingly. Because they demonized them. 
Brothers and sisters, this film is Roman Catholic frog spirit propaganda. I have not seen it, and I wouldn't recommend that anybody sees it for any reason whatsoever. Because it is simply that, propaganda. Where in the Bible do we read of Satan running along in the midst of people, as it's depicted up here, whispering in the ears of the demoniacal Jews, murder the Christ. And there it is depicted running through the crowds. Well, of course, the Jews are the demons, but we do have the heroes, Mary and Martha. Aren't they so lovely, decked out like a couple of nuns in their habits? Brothers and sisters, let's be aware. These people are brilliant. They are absolutely brilliant in what they do. And so they bring the sympathy of the world to the Catholic Church as being there right at the beginning, at the foot of the cross with the Lord Jesus Christ. We are the ones. We are the only church that can trace its, trace its roots back to that time. And they're right. Because they are the apostasy. That itself is a sign to us that they are the ones identifiable. It would be there in Paul's day, he says, and it will last until the Lord Jesus Christ comes and destroys it with the brightness of his coming. What other church on the face of the earth, or religion for that matter, could do that? There's the Jews. But Paul's talking about a falling away from the Christians. So what other Christian group could possibly trace itself right the way back? the time of the apostle. That is an identifier that they are the apostasy. Clearly, the Catholics see themselves as the kingdom of God. This is Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger. Now, he himself was a former member of Hitler Youth and of the Weiermark as well. Interestingly enough, he is currently the prefect of the Co Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith, formerly called, by the way, the Sacred Congregation for the Inquisition. See, it hasn't gone away. It's still there. They just renamed it and put somebody else in charge. This man is responsible, by the way, primarily for ecumenicalism, for bringing all the churches under the control. He was the one that signed the agreement with the Lutherans a few years back. He was the one that was center to it, the head of the Inquisition, squashing any Protestant group whatsoever, nothing has changed. And he wrote this book, this little pamphlet called Dominus Jesus. The mission of the church is to proclaim and establish among all peoples the kingdom of Christ and of God. She is on earth, the seed and the beginning of that kingdom. She is therefore a sign and an instrument of the kingdom. She is called to announce and to establish that kingdom. She is, therefore, the kingdom of Christ, already present in mystery. And so it is that these frog spirits have been succeeding. Here is the United Nations, a very, very anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist, anti-Israel group of nations. After the first uh, declaration that they made, the vote to endorse partition of Palestine, that was about it as far as their support of Israel went. Some statistics that are interesting is that from 1967 to 1988, so this is prior to all the current problems, there were 429 anti-Israel resolutions. 321 times Israel was condemned. And the Arabs? Not once. Brothers and sisters, are we blind? Can we not see that this is all nations moving against Jerusalem and against my people Israel? This specific slide here is the vote that was taken to pronounce Zionism as racism. 114 nations in favor, 11 abstentions, 4 against, resolution passed. That, brothers and sisters, is all nations against Jerusalem. Interesting that at that time, the United States stood up and basically said, we will never acquiesce and walked out with Israel. Just very recently, July the 21st, 2004, a resolution was passed in the United Nations condemning Israel once again and telling them to pull down this wall 
that they're putting up. No mention made, of course, of the Palestinians and all the terrorists coming in to blow the bejeebas out of all of the Israelis all the time, every other day. Another bomb goes off somewhere. Men, women, and children blown to smithereens. No mention of that. Ah, but Israel's building this wall. That is not just. That is not right. That is not equal. That is frog spirits. And so it was that Daniel Gilliman, the United Nations uh, ambassador from Israel, said, thank God that the fate of Israel and the Jewish people is not decided in this hall. This resolution cannot but embolden those who are the true enemies of Israel and the Palestinian people. Brethren and sisters, that is exactly what is taking place all over the world. The frog spirits are out there at work to turn the heart of the nations against the people of Israel, especially through the areas of Europe and the Arab world. Interestingly, the Passion wasn't produced in English. It was produced in Latin and Aramaic, which means that the only people that can really watch it and understand what's going on without reading the subtitles are Arabs. And so they are working to move them also against the Jews. All nations, brethren and sisters, are going to gather against Jerusalem to battle. They are going to come against Israel in what will be the great battle of Armageddon. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm, thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. The frog spirits are gathering the nations against Israel right now. Gog is being prepared and all his company with him. What about us, brethren and sisters? Are we prepared for the words of the Lord Jesus Christ? Because we live right in the middle of those two verses, between the gathering and the battle itself. And it's in this period that the Lord Jesus Christ clearly says to you and I, Behold, I come. <laughs> 